Hi there. The video you're about to see is a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, I just wanted to say this to warn you ahead of time. Uh, it's a bit more basic than other videos, so I spend a lot of time deriving backpropagation through time, which uh, is used for backpropagating through dynamical systems in these papers, or in this paper, and also, I spent quite a bit of time explaining the reparameterization trick and things of that nature. And then after that, uh, I go into three distinct examples that they give in the paper that all basically show the same thing. So the video is maybe a bit longer than it needs to be, especially if you're already experienced, uh, feel free to skip ahead. Just wanted to let you know um, such that you can uh, choose the parts that f suit you. All right, uh, with that being said, this is a current research paper. It, uh, is, it, it's quite cool what it shows. It shows that you might not always want to backpropagate through things, even though you can, especially if they're uh, iterated systems, especially if they're noisy and chaotic. And uh, they give some nice demonstrations of when that's actually not appropriate. So yeah, enjoy, bye-bye. In summary, Gradients are not all you need. Just because you can take a gradient doesn't mean you always should. That's how the paper ends. Now, what paper is this? This is a paper called Gradients are not all you need. And this is by Luke Metz, C. Daniel Freeman, Samuel S. Schoenholz and Tal Kachmann. This is a paper that argues against, in certain cases, against backpropagating through specifically dynamical systems that can exhibit chaotic uh, behavior. So it treats a bunch of applications of these things. Uh, for example, when people backpropagate through physics simulations, when people backpropagate through inner learned optimizers and so on. And it shows that very often in these cases, it can happen that the gradients you get uh, have extremely high variance, are extremely poorly behaved, and so on, and that it might be better to just use black box, uh, black box estimators for these gradients rather than actually backpropagating through the inner dynamical system. This might seem a, a little bit, um, this might seem a little bit, you know, far fetched and, and out there. But this is actually happening, people are back propagating through all sorts of things nowadays, as I said, physics simulations are now back propagatable, they're, they're, they're completely differentiable, you can back propagate through a physics simulation and and get a direct gradient. And the same goes with, uh, as I said, learned optimizers. So have an outer optimizer that learns an inner optimizer and so on. Uh, all of this stuff becomes differentiable. And people are very excited about this. But this paper argues that as it says, you may not always want to do that. And this paper uh, goes into the details of why that is the case, uh, what can be done about it and where you should pay attention. So they give a bunch of examples right here of um, of these what they call dynamical systems, iterated dynamical systems that you is are the basis for these observations. So in a very basic case in a linear iterated dynamic system, uh, you have a state s, and you apply a matrix a k. And that will give you the next state uh, s k plus one right here. However, if you do that over and over again, let's say you always have the same matrix A, and you just keep plugging in S in here, and get the next state. So you sort of plug it, plug it into a, it's a recursive system, or a recurrent system, one might call it, you simply plug in the same state over and over and over. Uh, or you put equivalently, you put your state through a neural network that has always the same parameters to get the next state, and then you put that state into the neural network, and so on. And you might uh, get a loss function at some point. This should you remind you, for example, of something like reinforcement learning, where you have a state s one that uh, you put through some neural network f in order to get the state s2, I'm sorry, not through a neural network, of course, f in this case might be uh, the environment, it might also be the 
inner environment model of your recurrent neural network. It might also be tracking the state. So you might always get an observation. You have an observation, you derive a state from it, and that state is being kept track by a neural network. So many things are possible right here. Uh, however, let's say this is some sort of a neural network that in some way estimates these state transitions, then each state you can technically derive a loss from maybe what kind of reward did you get or something like this. So this gives you loss one, this gives you loss two, this gives you loss three, and this gives you loss four. Well, that should be consistent in my else. Haha. <laughs> um, all of this together would obviously so this would result in a total loss being the sum of all the losses. So li and now the question is, if I now want to, so every one of these, this neural network is always the same, there is a parameter vector, that's part of all of these neural network. And now I want to know, how do I need to change my neural network? How do I need my to change my estimator of this series, whatever that is a state transition in a reinforcement learning problem, for example, how do I need to change this such that I do a better job? at uh, predicting the future, and therefore minimizing all of these losses. Well, that's as easy as computing a gradient, a derivative, sorry, obviously of my loss, uh, with respect to my parameters, right. And that's what that's exactly what's happening right here. Uh, so this should be familiar to you if you ever have taken a class on recurrent neural networks. This is the chain rule uh, applied to neural networks, uh, sorry to recurrent neural networks. So what you want to do is you can see the loss right here is basically the path to the loss is there are four paths to the loss right here. So what you want to do is you want to back propagate through all of the possible paths uh, that lead from the parameter vector uh, into the loss. It's a bit easier if you just consider one of the losses, let's just consider L4 right here. So what you want to do is you want to back propagate through this node, through here, here you encounter the first parameter vector. So that's one term in your that's one piece in your loss. And then but you also want to back propagate through this node right here, through it with the chain rule, back propagate through this path, that's going to be another one, another piece of your loss right here, and so on, you want to back propagate through here, up to here, and that's going to be another piece of your loss. Or of your of your uh, derivative, I should say, not of your loss of your derivative of the loss L4 with respect to the parameter vector. Similarly, you could do for the other losses. So if I did the same for L3, it would be only here, not to the right, obviously, because um, we we L3 does not depend on this application right here. So not that, but to here, so that would be another part of that gradient. And through here, that would be another part of that gradient. So you'd get these sums of sums. And that's exactly what you have right here, right? If the first step, we simply back propagate, we use the chain rule to expand this, uh, we back propagate to the step zero. And uh, from that to the parameters, plus maybe there's a direct influence on the parameters. The first loss, we have to take two different paths. Okay, so first, through the step one, sorry, state one, then back to state zero, which is, if you can see, that's the same as this right here. So here, and here is the same. Um, and that means that these two paths overlap, right? So if I look from we don't have L zero here, we have L one. So if I look this path, and the path that goes from here, back one state, and then up here, those two paths partially overlap, that's exactly this. And then there is also this one right here, this would be the direct path from here, like, uh, right up here. Well, okay, I screwed this up a little bit. But you know, 
<laughs> no one gets recurrent backpropagation right at the first try. In essence, what you do get is you do get these, these big sums of derivatives. And what you can see that the components of these sums as you go on, so these are the individual parts, you can see here is the general form for loss uh, t, so little lt. Um, you can see that the individual parts, they get longer and longer, right? One element, two elements, three elements, four elements uh, right here. And the inside parts here, the inside is always we derive state two with respect to state one, then state one with respect to state zero, and so on. And the general form of this is that you start um, at a loss uh, and you go to its given state. Then you go through the chain of states all the way back to state to you know state k, where k goes from one to t. But in the worst case, in the longest case, all the way to state one, I guess. That index is messed up right here, right? I think so. That should be like zero to match up here. That should be zero. Yes. Excellent. That should be zero. Good. We we made a difference. We found a mistake. Paper rejected. Go. Come on. <laughs> no. Okay. So the problem is obviously here. Uh, this is a single matrix, right? Um, if and we're applying it over and over and over again, right? We're, der we're deriving from the, uh, we're deriving through these state transitions again and again and again. And this can quickly get out of control, namely, um, so here, by the way, is the sum of sums. So this is the total, the derivative of the total loss is now a sum of sums. And inside each of these sums, uh, you have these expanding product, these telescope products. Think they're called telescope products. Not exactly sure. They say note that this product here appearing on the right hand side of equation eight, the matrix of partial derivatives that each state uh, derived with respect to the state right before it is exactly the Jacobian of the dynamical system F. That's the neural network. And this, and the, so the neural network or whatever that function is, right, defines how one state goes to the next one. So if we back propagate through it, we'll get the first derivative of and that's a, a Jacobian if this is a, um, a high dimensional map. This has precisely the iterated structure discussed in the beginning of this section. So the beginning of the section, we looked at what happens if we just have a matrix, we have a state, and the state that comes out, we plug in again. Thus, one might not be surprised to find that the gradients of loss functions of dynamical systems depend intimately on the spectra of Jacobians. So what do they mean? They mean that this Jacobian, it has some sort of an eigen spectrum. And what we do care about is uh, notably the biggest eigenvalue. So this Jacobian, it can be decomposed into, um, into two transformations and a diagonal and the diagonal is going to be composed of the eigenvalues and the largest eigenvalue here has a special uh, property. Namely, it determines uh, sort of the, the largest in, in absolute uh, number. So uh, let's let's just assume we only have positive eigenvalues for the sake of argument. If the largest eigenvalue here is um, larger than one, then the product, whatever vector, right, whatever vector I put in here, for almost all vectors, if I put them through this matrix, and then put them in again, and then put them in again, they're going to grow in norm. And if I do this enough times, then you just over time, if you look at the norm of whatever vector I put in, it's just going to grow exponentially, because every single time, it's going to be essentially multiplied by a number greater than one, at least in, in one component of the vector space. However, if that is smaller than one, then the opposite happens, namely, whatever vector I start with, it's going to essentially shrink uh, to almost nothing. And uh, both of these are uh, problematic. And in recurrent neural networks, you have heard them as two problems. So this problem here is called the exploding uh, 
uh, gradients problem. Gradients. And this here is called the vanishing gradients problem. Vanishing gradients. And the paper here makes the argument that essentially the, the dynamical systems that we're back propagating through, it's not only neural networks, but also, as I said, these simulations and so on, they suffer from the same fate right here. And it, it, it is even a bit, um, let's say, a bit more pronounced and a bit more hidden than it might be in recurrent neural networks. So they specifically talk about the reparameterization trick. So what happens if we have such a dynamical system and the dynamical system also has some noise on it? And one of the uh, one good example of this is uh, when you apply the reparameterization trick. So what is that? That is when I have, for example, a variational autoencoder. Variational autoencoder takes something like an image right here, puts it through a neural network uh, into now. If it was a regular autoencoder, it would put it into like a latent vector. That's the encoder. And then the decoder would reproduce the image from that latent vector. And the assumption here is that if that if we train this well enough, this latent vector will be a good description of what's in the image. It turns out that autoencoders by themselves don't really work. Um, no one knows exactly why, because it makes total sense, but might have something to do with the loss function or with them just being not super robust. Uh, however, variational autoencoders work a bit better. And what they do is their encoder notably does not produce a vector, like it doesn't produce the latent representation by itself. But what it does is it produces the distribution of the latent vectors. So what it does is it produces a whole bunch of mu and sigma parameters, essentially. So mu and sigma, mu and sigma. And they define the distributions of each of the components of the, uh, of the latent vector. So what we're saying is that all of the, late, the latent vector is essentially distributed like a Gaussian. And we are not predicting the latent vector itself. We're predicting the parameters of the distribution that describe the distribution of latent vectors. So we're somehow inferring from the image what the distribution of the latent vector might be. And now in order to actually get an image out of that, we need to do this step right here, this sampling, sampling step. And that we can shove into our decoder and then get an image out here. And all is good. But now we have to train the thing. So how do we train? We could do the same thing. We could apply a loss like we do in the autoencoder, compare the output and the input and say these two need to match. And, you know, we can do that. However, this is fine for the parameters of the decoder. The decoder has some parameters. We can backpropagate this loss totally to these parameters. The encoder also has some parameters. And then we run into the problem that we need to backpropagate through the decoder and we need to backpropagate through this sampling step right here, which is not possible. Now, what do people do? People have this reparameterization trick, where essentially, if you look at this as a parameterization graph, I have the input x here that goes through the um, through the encoder. That gives me let's just let's just say a mu and a sigma. Let's uh, write these as computation nodes. It gives me a mu and a sigma right here. So the parameters are in, in these two arrows that we need to get through. And now the usual way of doing of describing this is you, you say we use these two to get the distribution. And we use the distribution to sample the latent code h and we use that to produce through the decoder to produce the output. And again, we cannot back propagate through this thing right here. So what do we do? Otherwise, what we do is we say there is an interesting property of Gaussians, some other distribution as well, but of Gaussians specifically, namely that um, there is this thing called a normal distribution that has me mean zero and standard deviation one. And if I sample a variable x according to that, 
Um, and I, I imagine another distribution that has mu and sigma arbitrary parameters, not zero and one, a sample y from that, then x and y are related by the fact that y is exactly x times sigma plus mu. This is sometimes called a, a z uh, transform in statistics, I believe, or something like this. Essentially, what it says is that I can sample from a distribution with arbitrary parameters by first sampling from a normal distribution and simply multiplying uh, the output of that sample by mu and sigma. Now that's interesting because what we can now do, we can change our computation graph. We can have our sampling, uh, our, our distribution right here. We can have our distribution that is a normal distribution, mu zero, sigma one, we can sample from that, we can sample a, let's call it, let's call it z, just because we can. And then we can multiply it by sigma and add mu, right here we multiply, here we add, and that gives us that latent code. And now you see, we don't have to backpropagate through sampling, because sampling is down here. And our backpropagation path can be through here. This is called the reparameterization trick. And this turns out to be it turns out to be very good because we can train variational autoencoders, but it turns out to be a bit of a deception when we look at estimating gradients in these in these systems. So they make an analogy right here. And the problem, by the way, is the paper says is that if I have so my actual objective, my actual loss function here has a sort of a smoothing in it right, because of this sampling step. So this sampling step, it, it, it kind of smooths the loss function, right, there is a, a certain, uh, certain randomness in it. And if I average over the randomness, then that that gives the landscape a bit of a smooth feeling. However, as you can see, the gradient flow is not the, it, it is not the smoothed variant, the smoothing comes is down here. However, the gradient flow is straight through all the deterministic route. And that might screw up your gradients big time as far as I understand it, I'm actually not sure I understand this paper correctly. Um, they give an example right here, where they say, look, we have a function right here, that we believe to be quite wonky, which is this sine wave, uh, with a bit of a curve in it, you see the square function, those are these things here. And they change this w parameter. So the higher the w, the more uh, squiggly the line is, that's the that's the initial loss objective. And then they convolve that uh, with a with a Gaussian, which gives them the blue objective. Now what they do is they say, okay, can we use the reparameterization trick to estimate the gradients. And the point here is that I believe what the point is, is that the blue thing is the true objective, right? The one that's actually has the noisy parts in it. That is the true loss. That's the true objective you want to estimate the gradient from. However, your reparameterization trick gradient, it will be, uh, it will be along the red function along the squiggly function. If that's not if I'm saying something wrong, I might be then I'm, I'm really sorry, that's how I understand it. So if the oscillations are quite low, then the reparameterization tricks works super well. In fact, it works about one or two orders of magnitude better than if we were to use a black box method to estimate the gradient black box method is, I mean, essentially, it's a uh, you have a you have a function, right, you evaluate it at two points like here and here, you draw the line, you say like the gradient is kind of like the, the, uh, the, the, the steepness of the line right there. You, it's not, it's not that much more, it's just in higher dimensions. Um, so obviously, reparameterization trick is going to work better because we can have exact derivatives. However, the more squiggly the line gets the 
more the noisy objective and the objective where the reparameterization gradient flows are going to sort of diverge from each other. And as you can see, the reparameterization uh, gradient is not, it's not the case that it's wrong. It's just the case that its variance is very high, right? So it's, it's not, it's, as far if I understand correctly, the gradient is still, let's say, correct. It's, it's uh, unbiased, right? Uh, however, its variance is going to be super high. If we um, if we look at different samples, if we look at different places along uh, maybe the the x axis, it's going to be very 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 uh, high variance. Instead, the um, repermit sorry the black box gradient it doesn't it doesn't really care. It's just going to estimate pretty much the same. Um, with the same variance in all of the issues. And this is what the paper's claim ultimately is, is that there are situations where backpropagating through dynamic systems is a good idea. And there are situations where backpropagating through dynamic systems is a bad idea uh, because the gradients have very high variance and you'd be better off estimating the gradient uh, using some sort of a black box optimizer. So even though you could backpropagate through the system, you're better off just sort of estimating the gradient uh, by something like uh, uh, what I just said right here, or an ES, and uh, is it an evolutionary step? I'm not exactly sure. They dive into three different examples. So first, uh, rigid body physics. And here they say they, they use uh, Brax, which is a package that provides very, very fast physics simulations. And on top of that, differentiable physics simulations, right? Excellent. This is really exciting because differentiating through uh, physics simulations means that you could technically optimize some stuff uh, really well. Uh, instead of doing reinforcement learning, you can now just look at, you know, which action would actually bring my loss down because I can factor in how the world would react to my actions. Uh, in this case, they say, um, we, we, yeah, right. So there is, we look at policy optimization of some stochastic policy parameterized by a neural network. We test this using the default ant environment and default uh, multi-layer perceptron policy. So this is not a, a big problem. This is not a very complicated problem. Um, but it's enough to show this effect. So this is a stochastic policy parameterized via a neural network, which means that is this is you get the observation, this goes into a state by a state encoder, this then goes through a neural network, that's going to give you an action and a next state. Right, and the action is going to be stochastic if I can, um, if I estimate this correctly. So it's, give, it's giving you an action distribution, like maybe this, sometimes this, sometimes this, sometimes this action, or maybe it's a continuous, actually. I think it's continuous, ant is probably continuous. So it's gonna give you some sort of a distribution over actions, and to get the real action, you actually need to sample, right? Now, does that sound familiar? Yes, it should, right? So this action, this so this is the action distribution. Let's uh, how, how do I make something into distribution? A squiggly line, double double barrel thing. Okay, <laughs> to get the real action, you need to sample, and you push that into the environment, and the environment's going to give you a next observation, and that together with this state, probably, maybe I don't know if this state gets in or not, is going to to lead to state two, and then we start again. Right. The important part right here is that if we backpropagate through the environment, which we can do with Brax, right, uh, and we can also backpropagate through the stochastic policy, we could technically optimize this neural network here directly to change to the actions that actually give a much, much better outcome. However, is this act, does this actually work in practice? So here is an experiment they do. So what they do is they check, um, they do different unroll lengths. So they make a plot and say, 
What if we unroll this policy for one step, for two steps, for four steps, eight and 16? That essentially means how many steps in the environment are we going to wait before we do the back propagation? You can't wait for the whole episode. That would blow your memory. Uh, so usually these reinforcement learning tasks, even if they do, if they don't back propagate through the environment, they will stop after a number of steps and then back propagate through that. It is a bit of a limited horizon. So you want to do as many as you can, uh, ideally, in order to get uh, really good improvements. So here you can see different lines for a different number of unrolls. The randomness is fixed. So this is always essentially starting from the same state. And what they plot here is mean loss um, over these unrolls. And what they plot here is shift along a random direction. So in this neural network, this here is a big vector of parameters. They take one of those parameters and they just shift it a little bit. They just shift it a little bit, as far as I can understand. And they show what happens to the loss as they do that, right? Now you can see if you consider one step look ahead, it's still it's pretty smooth, but still like there is a lot of change in the loss as you move this uh, around. Um, uh, yeah, so then and if you look at more and more and more on rolls, you can see that this becomes more and more noisy, the variance as you shift long becomes heavier and heavier. And these systems become, I think the paper calls them chaotic, which means that a little change in the initial condition will lead to a big change in the sort of in the outcome. And that's essentially their, their problem right here is that you can't really estimate these gradients um, through these dynamical systems, because just the variance of the gradients will be really, really high. And they show right here, what happens if we don't just look at one on roll, but we do a bunch of on rolls, right, we take the average over the randomness over the unrolls, And as you can see, that helps, right, you. So this is a fixed, I believe this is um, an eight step on roll. So it's just from this eight step on roll, which is a reasonable look ahead, they take a bunch of them, and they just average over them. And that gives you a kind of a smoother line if you can see right here. So even if you take the average over different samples, if you then unroll for more, you can see that it still the gradient variance essentially explodes. This here is a log scale over the mean gradient variance. That's essentially how many squiggles uh, happen up and down as you shift along these directions. And you can see that it's it just kind of explodes. And that's uh, the problem that the paper wants to highlight. They go into two more examples right here. Um, one is a meta learning an optimizer. So that's when you have essentially an outer you have an outer optimizer, you have a big optimizer, optimizer big, <laughs> that is that optimizes optimizer small, that optimizes a loss, right. So optimizer small is doing its inner updates for a neural network optimizing a loss. And the big optimizer is essentially optimizing the parameters of the inner optimizer. So you want to learn to learn. And for that, what you want to do is you want to take this optimizer right here, run a bunch of these steps here, see how much did you decrease the loss, and then learn the parameters of the inner optimizer such that the loss is decreased uh, more in future iterations. It's a, it's a bit of an it's a bit of an alchemy field, I feel like this, I'm not I'm not so sure about um, <laughs> about inner optimizers and so on. But you can, you know, you can back propagate through the uh, inner unrolling, you can unroll the inner optimizer, you can back propagate through all of it. And therefore, you could learn the outer optimizer like this. Again, you can see right here, depending on how long you unroll, if you unroll for just eight steps, uh, the the uh, 
system does not behave that chaotic. You can see that the lines is pretty flat as you again shift a lot one parameter along a given direction. However, as soon as you go up to more sort of reasonable things to unroll, like what actually people do in order to learn something, then you can see that uh, the system just behaves quite uh, heavily chaotic. Namely, as you shift a little bit, uh, the parameters change. Again, you can remedy that a little bit by averaging. Uh, this is an average over, um, doesn't even over are shown in color. Okay, we don't actually know which of these lines we average over, I think. I think it's one of the like it's either the 512 or the 256 that they average over. And it smooths down. However, still, uh, as you can see right here, depending on the shift, uh, there can be situations where the variance as you unroll and this isn't even like this isn't even for long, right? So as the that the variance just explodes right here. Again, this is a system with a bit of randomness uh, because the inner optimizer is trained on mini batches and the mini batches are sampled randomly, right? And uh, this randomness comes external to the optimizer. So the optimizer, the randomness essentially enters from a different direction, which essentially gives the same artifact as the reparameterization trick. The last example they go into is a a not some sort of a deep learning thing. It's um, disk packing. So this is like you have a volume, and you want to pack two different sizes of disk, so big disks, and uh, small disks. And you, you want to figure out like how, uh, how should I pack the disks such that they're packed the most and you can do that via back propagation. And they see the same behavior right here that if they sort of back propagate, so you can run, I think the simulation here, and um, you can back propagate through it. And the result is essentially the same is that um, there are, so this is that diameter of the smaller particle with respect to the larger particle, you can see that sometimes it's well behaved. However, as you um, get to as you get to like regions where this uh, particle becomes rather small, you unroll for a number of steps, this becomes very unstable, it becomes very chaotic, a uh, small change in the initial parameters leads to a big change in the end uh, result. And same thing right here, if you unroll for a number of steps, the variance of your gradients just becomes huge. And therefore, it's not really optimal to learn from it. So what does that all tell you? They go into different experiments right here. So they say, um, we go back to the first experiment of the ant, and we look at the spectrum of eigenvalues of that policy. And what they find is they compare uh, two different runs with two different initializations. In it, one is initialized in an unstable regime. So in one of these chaotic regimes where they observe the gradient exploding or the gradient variance exploding. And in it two, which is in a stable regime, and they wonder what's the difference. So they look at the spectrum of the eigenvalues of the Jacobians as they back propagate. And what they find is that in the one initialization, the unstable one, you have quite a number of, um, of eigenvalues that have a norm larger than one. The eigenvalues can be imaginary. So everything outside the circle is norm one, everything outside is larger. And you can see right here, that um, if they look at the, the different steps, you can see that after a while, uh, you can clearly see that the maximum absolute eigenvalue it shoots up into these are this is again a log scale. And if you look at the product of Jacobians, right, which is what you would do if you actually unroll for a number of steps, then that product just grows, essentially, every time it encounters one of these big eigenvalues, it just uh, bumps up, it just grows in in norm. So this is again, the, the eigenvalue, but essentially, 
what you would multiply your loss or your vectors by. And again, yeah, so the, the gradient norms correspondingly rise uh, exactly with the rise in the biggest eigenvalue of the Jacobian. This is kind of like a straightforward consequence. So their conclusion is if in the well-behaved behaved, uh, initialization, this doesn't happen. So, so their conclusion is, uh, look, if you can, if you can try to keep your eigenvalues of your Jacobians smaller than one. Now that's easier said than done. So what can you actually do? They say pick well-behaved systems. This isn't that helpful because sometimes you actually want to study these uh, not so well-behaved systems, right? So for recurrent neural networks, they say there are initializations that can help. So there is a um, initialization, sorry, they, they initialize the RNN near the identity. This means that the recurrent Jacobian will have eigenvalues near one and thus be able to be unrolled longer before encountering issues. However, after training progresses and weights update, the Jacobian drifts eventually resulting in vanishing or exploding gradients late enough in training. So this is not that much of a remedy. They also suggest a second solution is to change the problem entirely. In the case of an RNN, this is feasible by simply changing the neural architecture. And I guess this is what everyone learned at those classes on recurrent neural networks is that things like LSTMs and uh, GRUs, they generally avoid this problem. Um, the recurrent Jacobian of an LSTM was specifically designed to avoid this exponential sensitivity to the hidden state because it has these gates and additions and so on. And, and uh, may I say residual connections and is thus significantly more robust than a vanilla RNN. Nevertheless, it can, it can still happen, right? But with an LSTM, you're sort of more protected. In rigid uh, body physics, they talk about, um, talk about maybe you have to go to a complicated solution. So instead of if you have particles and they kind of bump into each other and uh, bump into each other, maybe you have to chunk up your simulation into different parts. So into this part where you can back propagate through, then they're in a part where there's a collision. And then once the collision happened, you can again simulate forward and then back propagate through that part and so on. So um, now I wanna actually go down here, jump a little bit and discuss these two sections right here, truncated back propagation and uh, gradient clipping. And this is an idea that I guess everyone has when you look at these results is that can't we just kind of clip the gradient or like if the gradient's too big, just kind of tone it down a little bit uh, in order to not run into these issues, right? During back propagation, we might just, you know, cap the gradient somewhere and then we don't have these big gradients. The problem is that of course, by doing that, you bias the gradient, you it's no longer the true gradient. And they have, for example, um, done this in this Brax environment right here in this ant task. And they say, in this task, we back propagate the task reward directly to the policy parameters after 400 steps for truncation length t, a sorry, for truncation length t, a stop gradient up was inserted every t steps into the 400 step uh, trajectory. So they truncate the back propagation through time. So they would, instead of back propagating through all the sequence, they would just chunk it into like lengths of let's say three. So they introduce a stop gradient after each three steps. And that would essentially make it such that the loss from here can only go to here. As I said before, uh, that is already happening when we unroll for sort of not as many steps because of memory constraints. But now we chunk even smaller because we're afraid that the gradient will explode even if we uh, so for the r uh, length that we unroll. Now, what they find is that there is a narrow band uh, where this actually works. However, um, and I guess I guess that's the band right here where the reward is high. 
Um, but they they essentially their 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 conclusion is that this disturbs the gradient so much uh, that essentially you diminish your ability to learn anything because the gradients are no longer good unbiased gradients and i guess the same goes with gradient clipping they said if they tried the gradient clipping in so as before this calculation of the gradient is biased to demonstrate this we took the same and policy and sweep learning rate and gradient clipping strength i guess swept or yeah we found no setting which results in positive performance and thus omitted the plot right zero zero positive performance here uh with gradient clipping in this very simple environment uh, that could actually be optimized fairly easily and that also reinforcement learning can optimize fairly easily so here you can already see the difference and the difference is their fourth recommendation uh, just use black box gradients and by black box gradients they essentially mean you know these estimators that i've shown you or for example reinforce which is uh, this uh, gradient estimator through black box environments that is often used in reinforcement learning reinforce gives you an unbiased gradients uh, they also say in addition to the unbiased methods there are other methods and you might know them from reinforcement learning for example proximal policy optimization easily outperforms all of our experiments uh, training the and policy with gradients that we perform so the and policy with gradients i guess and there you have it this is a clear this is at least one or three demonstrations uh, where if you back propagate through the environment even though you can it is more efficient to use a black box let's say reinforcement learning uh, gradient estimator rather than the true gradient because in chaotic systems the true gradients variances explodes um, as you back propagate through long sequences of these dynamical systems and that's how they reach their conclusions they say uh, we hope this paper sheds light into when gradients can be used namely when the recurrent jacobian has small eigenvalues in the other cases when gradients do not work we encourage readers to try black box methods they estimate the same quantity and with less pathological variance properties especially when it's possible to calculate a smooth proxy for the loss function of interest in summary gradients are not all you need just because you can take a gradient doesn't mean you always should and that's the ending of this paper um i know this was a bit of a a bit of a all the way through uh starting out from you know the reparameterization trick and whatnot but i hope you've seen the point that the paper makes is that um you know things going more and more differentiable can be dangerous especially in the presence of chaotic systems especially when there's a component of stochasticity involved um, you might want to think twice about really back propagating through these systems because it might just be as effective to use a to use a good old black box optimizer that was it let me know what you think and i'll see you next time bye bye